If you want to know what's going on in Chile, just take a look at the city walls. Unfiltered messages plastered across the streets of Santiago. Chile has awoken, yes, to the new constitution. Apruebo, I approve. One of the characteristics of Chile's society is that it occupies public spaces with political murals. These murals are forms of media communication in themselves, and from them we feel the pulse of what's happening. What's happening is that on September the 4th, Chileans will go to the polls to decide whether or not to ratify a new constitution. It all started in 2019 when, after years of simmering anger over growing social inequality, a simple hike in the cost of metro fares lit the fuse. Millions of Chileans took to the streets, demanding an end to the free market system that had made commodities out of things like healthcare, education, pensions, at their expense. To lead the charge, they voted in Chile's first socialist president in 50 years, Gabriel Boric, on the promise of change. Change premised on one narrative thread, one unifying story, targeting the current constitution which enshrined neoliberalism in Chile and is widely seen as the source of the country's ills. Chile's current constitution dates back to 1980, drawn up by the then military dictator, General Augusto Pinochet. That process took place behind closed doors, and it was only the media aligned to that regime that got any access. Some 40 years later, the new draft is being hashed out here in Congress, and unlike the last time, it's been streamed across multiple platforms for all to see. It's a complicated, challenging process conducted by political newcomers, elected by voters, disenchanted by traditional politicians. Most of the 155 assembly members drafting the new charter have never done anything like this before. One of them is Patricio Fernandez. During the 1990s, he founded a renowned political satire magazine, The Clinic. It's one of the few independent media outlets that took regular jabs at Pinochet and his legacy. A legacy Fernandez is now trying to rewrite. The citizens who took to the streets across the country have a deep mistrust of the political establishment. So that's why most assembly members are independent, including myself. Chile is a very segregated country where there's rarely been this kind of dialogue between rich and poor, and where, for the first time ever, a political process is led by an indigenous Mapuche Indian. How will this end? We'll see on September 4th. No, it's not. Media ownership in Chile is very concentrated and positioned ideologically. El Mercurio is a bastion of the Chilean right, as is La Tercera as well as lots of TV channels. Their editorial lines have shown there was never any desire for this process. The coverage has exposed a preference for the anecdotal over the big picture, and they've discredited the process by exaggerating its potential dangers. Those owners fear the impending structural changes that a new constitution might mean for Chile and it plays out in their coverage. Headlines threatening economic instability, the state taking over the National Bank, pensioners losing their savings. And then there's the indigenous angle, their demands for rights and recognition recast in the media, stories of the Chilean flag being replaced, national anthems being rewritten, the end of the Chilean Republic. Disinformation presented to the Chilean public as a possible outcome of the constitutional referendum. Certain narratives have been established in the media. One pits the idea of national unity and a unique national identity against indigenous demands for recognition in a country where many different peoples cohabit. 
This pervasive patriotic media narrative has been repeated again and again, particularly by El Mercurio, where you can see various calls to take back the traditional values of the Republic, values that are supposedly threatened by diversity and pluralism. The new constitution seeks to redistribute power. Today, those who own legacy media outlets are the ones with economic power. They are part of the elite and they're scared because they know it's going to be much harder for them to get rich at the country's expense. The fear that they're going to have to redistribute their wealth is reflected in the editorial lines of outlets like El Mercurio and La Tercera. Media structures in Chile are closely associated with economic power. This new constitution threatens that power with the nationalization of things like private pensions, health services, even agricultural reforms. Chile is the only country in the world where water has been commodified. The media elite is scared that its varied interests are at stake if even water is to be nationalized under a constitutional rule change. Chileans know this story. El Mercurio has been at the center of the country's political life since the 1800s. During the 1970s, it was paid by the CIA to fund a propaganda campaign to bring down the socialist government of President Salvador Allende. When he was overthrown in the 1973 military coup led by General Pinochet, the paper notoriously covered up the brutality of the dictatorship that followed mass torture, disappearances, death. When Pinochet finally managed to push through the current version of Chile's constitution in 1980, El Mercurio cheerled its implementation. After the 80s, the media did start opening up, and there were oppositional papers. But how did the system work? The media depended on government advertising to survive. And the state obviously privileged El Mercurio and La Tercera. And this has carried on into the democratic period because the governments know these outlets have a big influence on public opinion. And as a result, the more independent media outlets have found it impossible to survive. That might be set to change because in the new draft of the Constitution, there are recommendations that many at the helm of the media establishment will not take too kindly. The proposals for the new Constitution change the 1980 Charter significantly when it comes to the media. They go against neoliberal monopolies and they call for regional, local and community outlets. They also push for a framework where the state builds a media which fulfills its role as a public service. We, as journalists, have also been responsible for the problems that caused the social uprising. We let things go on for too long, and we failed to report on the people's demands. There's a mural in La Victoria, a poor era of Santiago, that reads, communication at the service of the people. Comunicación al servicio del pueblo. We mustn't forget this. It's an important lesson for us about the practice of journalism itself. El periodismo actual. The rebellion on the streets says a lot. We can see that most of the murals are in support of the process. And this is only going to keep growing as we near the September 4th referendum. A referendum which presents Chile with a choice. Bury Pinochet's constitution. Yes or no?